Good morning, everyone. My name is Seth Youssef. I'm a security field CTO based out of Paris, France, here in Snowflake. And with me, Prasun Shukla is our uh, senior product manager for the database security. Today's agenda is we're going to be talking about security for data apps. And probably by now you heard a lot probably about apps in Snowflake and you heard the name like native apps, connected apps, managed apps. If you don't, we're going to give you a few details to set you up for the session. And if you see on a slide that uh, golden medallion, that means it's a best practice we recommend you to do. So let's start by a quick definition is uh, when you want to go and choose a data app in Snowflake, you have two major decisions to make over here. You need to choose what kind of deployment. And actually, there are two dimensions for those decisions, the deployment pattern and the tenancy or the isolation patterns. The deployment patterns is basically where you want to ask those questions. Where the data processing happens, what, where is the data actually uh, resides, and who pays for the costs of Snowflake. And in terms of isolation is how the data is organized, how the data is isolated, and how the data, the, the compute actually is isolated as well between tenants. I'm going to go and start defining what uh, deployment patterns we have in Snowflake. So we have the first one is called uh, managed apps over here, if that laser works. Yeah, it's here. So managed apps means uh, it's a software as a service app. So basically you connect to um, an application and you might not know actually there is a Snowflake running behind the scene. The app provider, the one who builds the app, owns and manage the underlying Snowflake accounts. In connected apps, you have a Snowflake account and there is an app provider and then you can connect that app to your Snowflake account so you as an app consumer, you own and you pay the costs for that underlying Snowflake account. Native apps, that's in this slide it shows in private preview, but basically in the summit probably you heard now uh, it is in public preview. So the update cycle is not that fast on the slides. And this, this means the, uh, the application execution and orchestrations all happens, all that happens within the same Snowflake ecosystem. The app provider will create the app, will publish that app in Snowflake marketplace, or via direct sharing. And as an app consumer, you get that app like as you get any data sharing objects in a Snowflake and you run that app within your environment. So that's what the deployment patterns are. From isolation side of the, sto the house of the, of, the, of the story is we have a three as well. So everything comes in, uh, in threes here. Uh, we have the multi-tenant tables where basically the app consumers or tenants, they share the same table. But Snowflake uses uh, views, UDFs, uh, row access policies, column level security, in a, and are back as well to provision the isolation between tenants. And you might notice here in this model as well, the compute are pooled and shared between different tenants. The other one is called object per tenant, which basically OPT. So you're going to hear the term MTT, OPT, APT. So object per tenant, every tenant has its own set of database and the related objects. And the data is isolated at the database level. RBAC will provide the isolation between those tenants. And as you can see here, the compute as well is isolated. Every tenant has its own set of uh, warehouses to run their queries. And the last one is the up, um, account per tenant. And here, every tenant might have one or more accounts physically or what you call it physically is basically logical, but the, the account is isolated uh, per, per tenant. And in a top of all the isolation the, uh, controls that you have in MTT and OPT, you have uh, network isolation at this level, and then you might bring your own key to the encryption as well. Now, the, the this decision which deployment pattern and which Isolation pattern you're going to use based on a use case or a business case is out of scope of this session. However, the best practices that we're going to be providing you here might influence that decision, which one you might uh, go with. And on top of that, 
you can mix and match. So you can have managed app, uh, account pertinent, or you might have connected app with object pertinent. So those you can mix and match between them as well. Now, whatever deployment pattern you choose or isolation pattern you choose, there will be always defense in depth in a snowflake. And what that means, it means whatever you choose, those will apply all the time. First of all, you choose your data and you store your data in securable objects like tables, views, what have you. You create entitlement tables to have uh, um, uh, row access policies, column level security, and what have you. So that's the first layer. The second layer is going to be the role-based access control, and that will provide uh, least privileged access to the environment, and you give your um, uh, entities or users the minimum level of privileges to do their jobs. And then you will have the identity and um, access management where basically you, you define and how you authenticate users, how you authorize users to actually use uh, Snowflake, the underlying Snowflake account. And on top of that, you will have the network security uh, protection where here you have, you can use those to isolate between tenants to protect, or maybe you wanna block, cut off all the public access to your Snowflake account. Now, all this, we call it Snowflake account. Snowflake account by default has regional high availability. If you have multi-region or cross-cloud high availability, you can use account replication. Uh, data is encrypted all the time at rest using IAS-256. Users' um, uh, activities against your Snowflake account all is uh, recorded and read only history objects for your auditing and monitoring. Snowflake runs across natively through uh, across three uh, basic cloud providers, um, hyperscalers like AWS, uh, um, GCP, and Azure. And this is where your app comes into play. The app will manage the user sessions. The app will connect on behalf of the end users and the co using Snowflake drivers and connectors, and they have to go through all those layers. Now, your app can choose to be integrated with your identity uh, provider. Maybe you have um, a single source of truth to, uh, for user and roles provisioning, and that helps you to have identity governance and single sign-on. The app consumers, normally they connect to the app, and the app connects to Snowflake on behalf of them, but there are certain situations where the app consumers, they may connect directly to the underlying Snowflake account. For example, connected app, you are the owner of that Snowflake account. Or, like for instance, if you have an account per tenant and the consumer wants to log in for auditing and monitoring to see what's happening within that account that runs their applications. Now, this is the uh, defense in, de uh, in, in depth. We're going to be using this on our, our agenda today, starting with network uh, policy, where um, Prasoon will take it away from here. All right, Seth. Hard to follow that, by the way. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Prasoon Shukla. I'm the product manager for database security at Snowflake. And let's talk about network security and why is network security important. And so why is network security important? It is the first line of defense in our defense in depth paradigm. It answers primarily two questions. From where and where how you can connect to Snowflake account. And second, what networks are accessible or what networks have access to your Snowflake account? So let's look at the connectivity aspect of it. So if your app is hosted in a different CSP provider than your Snowflake account, well, then the connection between your app uh, and the Snowflake account goes over public internet. And if you look at what I mean by connectivity or public internet, there are like four kinds of uh, communication channels. One is the connectivity to the um, Snowflake account, the public URL itself. The second is to the OCSP provider host. The third is uh, to the uh, Snowflake managed uh, storage or S3 buckets or Azure blob, which is the internal stages. And the, the fourth one is going out from uh, Snowflake to customer managed storage, which is the external stages. Now, if your app is hosted in the same CSP or cloud service provider as the Snowflake account, or it is on-prem, one of the options is to have private connectivity all the way through to the service or the internal stages. And what in this scenario, private 
private link connectivity is a business critical ed uh, addition feature by Snowflake, and it leverages the private link service of the CSP, that is uh, AWS Private Link, Azure Private Link, or the PSC, uh, GCP Private Connect. And um, uh, one of the things that I would like to point out over here is uh, uh, private link connectivity uh, is uh, desired in scenarios where you have a highly regulated industry or you have a compliance or strict uh, compliance or security requirement. Now, when you think about private link connectivity and both public and private, it sort of creates a lot of URLs that Snowflake supports, and sometimes it can be very intimidating. So, how do you keep track of these? So that's why we have the system, um, the allow list function, allow list private link and allow, uh, allow list that give you all the URLs that you would need to manage that connectivity. Also, we have uh, different formats for that URL for drivers and connectors. We have a different format for SnowSite. We have an account regionless URL now. Uh, you have OCSP URL format. So we, all of these are there, they're documented and for you to use. But coming back to so, certain best practices, now, if you have private link connectivity all the way to your service or your internal stage, that does not mean that the, uh, uh, the public access is blocked. You have to specifically configure a network policy to block access to your uh, service or the internal stages. And if you have a network infra security infrastructure, which everyone does, you would have to make the URLs, the, uh, make that infrastructure aware about the URLs. So you have to sort of configure these uh, Snowflake URLs in your uh, firewall and proxy. So uh, let's talk about network policies. So network pro policies are primitive network security constructs. And at the essence of it, there are, say, a flat list of IP addresses that you want to allow or deny access to, uh, you, uh, to your Snowflake account. I mean, if you get a new Snowflake account, you, the first thing that you do is you have to set up a network policy. And this network policy can be applied at an account level. Uh, so it uh, applies to all communication in and out. It, uh, it, apply, uh, it, uh, apply, it can be applied at an integration level, that is a skim integration. That means if you're provisioning users or an OAuth integration, and you can apply it at the user levels. And the most specific policy sort of wins. So user policy overrides integration, overrides account over here. Now, managing IP addresses is a a bit of a over to put, uh, to put it mildly. So by show of hands, how many of you are sort of tired of managing IP addresses? They change, they uh, get merged into di uh, different uh, bigger subnets, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they ch uh, basically they, they change uh, over, uh, morph over time. So what we have done is introduce something called as network rules. And network rules is nothing but a uh, schema level object that is a logical grouping of identifiers, like IPv4s, but we have also added the support for cloud identifiers, like VPC IDs or link IDs. So now if you have private link connectivity um, uh, deployed to your Snowflake account, uh, you can use these cloud identifiers to sort of uh, restrict access. So, and, and I'll talk, to, uh, talk about what the benefits of these are. Um, not only that, you can use the same network rules to uh, uh, restrict access to internal stages. And these network rules get referenced in a policy and um, uh, they are evaluated separately. So, and I'll show you an example of how that looks like. So here's a network rule with uh, an AWS VPC ID and it is referenced and it's an, a type IPv4. So there are types of, uh, uh, there is a, another, sorry, type AWS VPC ID and there is a type IPv4. And both of these rules can be referenced inside a, a network policy. And of course, the benefits are very clear. It's, uh, you can move away from the overhead of IP-based management. Um, if you have private link connectivity and have uh, uh, private IP addresses, there can be an overlap in these subnets. So this helps you sort of sort that out and of course, harden your internal stages. Now, one question that I do get frequently asked is, oh, so what are the IPs that I should stick it in the policy and now the network rule. So this can be anything. This can be an external IP address of your data app. It can be an IP address of your IDP, Okta or Azure, uh, where basically you're provisioning the users from. Or it can be your external IP or egress IP of your security infrastructure, like NAT gateways and firewalls or what have you. So just to summarize, 
Um, Seth introduced the isolation patterns. I just want you to summarize the best practices here for network policies. So network rules, um, you can have uh, separate network rules per tenant for MTT and OPT, and you can have one or more network rules per tenant. And networks, uh, network rules should not also direct access from the um, app customers. So uh, with private link connectivity, connectivity, you can have multiple endpoints mapping to the uh, same Snowflake account. Uh, for APT, we have a very logical account-based separation here, so that is not a problem. So uh, when you talk about deployment patterns, the app pro uh, provider is responsible for managing the network policies, rules, private link connectivity. In terms of, in case of connected app, it's the responsibility of the consumer, the app consumer, to actually set this up. And of course, native app follows very similar uh, recommendations to connected apps. So with that, I'll pass it on to Seth for IAM best practices. Thank you very much. Uh, the IAM actually is a very complicated topic in the um, app um, uh, world, and it will have its own little agenda here. I'll be starting with the uh, um, consideration for user and role provisioning, and Preston will take it away with the rest of the um, authentication and authorization patterns we have in Snowflake. Um, before we start user um, provisioning um, uh, discussion, there are a few populations in, uh, of users in data apps. And those will be first, the app provider needs to access to the underlying Snowflake account, like DevOps, they wanna create objects, they wanna run the apps. And the second one is gonna be the auditing and monitoring uh, user po and roles populations. Those, they wanna see how the app behaves, they wanna see how the, the, uh, the, the maybe the security and auditing uh, uh, compliance requirements as well for that specific data app. And then, you have the application programmatic access. And this is basically the users and roles that are used on behalf of the users to access the underlying Snowflake account. And finally, the app consumer or end users, they want to access to the underlying Snowflake account. And those, uh, as we said, could be in a specific use cases such as connected apps or like um, account per tenant. Now, I want to focus a little bit more on the um, programmatic access. And here we have, you have two different options. So you have uh, service account programmatic access, single sign-on programmatic access. In the service account, the application has a specific service account, one or more, to connect to Snowflake on behalf of the app, app consumer and customers. And all your queries, will be run under that service account identity. Snowflake won't be able to see the end user identity in that use case. From single sign-on perspective, all the queries will be run under the end consumer or the, the end customer or the app consumer user identity, and they will be using OAuth to authenticate to Snowflake. Now, if you, in all, in all cases, by the way, you need to provision users and roles in Snowflake. So, the user should, should be created in Snowflake to be able to connect to Snowflake. Now, what are, let's contrast those two, right? And that's with golden medallion, that means that's a best practice slide, keep that in mind. So from skim provisioning, in Snowflake, we define two uh, different types of roles. We call them functional roles and access roles. And you will see the definition of that later on in a later slide. So um, skim provisioning is recommended for user provisioning and for functional roles provisioning, because this could live in your IDP. They are controlled in your IDP. And that, and actually that's recommended for both uh, service account and single sign-on uh, user use case. And this will help you to have a uniform user and roles uh, provisioning, and it helps you as well with the deprovisioning, right? So you create a user, and when the user like is no longer needed, you need to deprovision it. That's a requirement from your auditing and compliance team. And then you have this, uh, the SQL provisioning, where basically you create user, create role within Snowflake. And here what we do is, for users, always we recommend you to use single source of truth. For roles, we you recommend you to use that for access roles only. Access roles are database significant. They are not normally live or exist at the uh, in your identity provider. Now, what in terms of what you need to provision, in service account provisioning, you need only the service accounts, plus all the other user population we discussed before. In single sign-on use case, you need to do that to provision um, all the end uh, con customers or app consumers 
and just watch out, you might end up managing large number of users population inside of Snowflake. Keep that in mind. Now, let's see how that plays out in terms of isolation patterns. So, um, first of all, you need to provision the, the it doesn't matter MTT, uh, OPT or APT, you need to provision the users and roles. And now the thing that I would like you to see here, MTT and OPT normally the end cost customers or the app consumers are not allowed to access Snowflake, so they don't need those users and roles, right? And actually to have extra layer of security, remember, defense in depth, you add network policies that uh, Prasoon mentioned to actually uh, allow only the trusted IPs to log into your uh, Snowflake account. Now in APT, in APT basically every um, Tenant has its own account, so basically uh, maybe the app consumers want to access the underlying Snowflake account for compliance reason and for auditing and monitoring. What does that mean from deployment patterns? The managed app, the app provider, should manage all the aspects of users and roles provisioning. In connected apps, this is like, it's the same like managed app, but I want to, you know, uh, stress that the app provider should not have any privilege to create and provision any users or roles. In, in native apps, the app consumers, you remember like you get the app, you install it in your system. So as an app consumer, you should have full, um, uh, you, you should have full control over your own user and roles uh, population. And for user access and best practices and what we have in you in store, that will go back to Prasoon. All right, so this, um talk about user access uh, best practices, general hygiene of how users should access Snowflake. And um, if you look at it, so one of the uh, frequently asked question is, okay, what authentication method should I use for my data app? And that sort of primarily depends on what your data app supports in terms of uh, capabilities. If it supports OAuth, please go for OAuth all the time. That's the recommendation. Um, uh, Snowflake supports external OAuth and Snowflake OAuth, and I'm going to cover that in a little bit of a detail in, a, in the slides to come. And then, if you don't have OAuth, well, go for key pair authentication. Um, and it's and uh, key pair authentication is widely used for programmatic access through service accounts. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And if you don't have that, well, you default to username and password. And as you can see, the um, the the clients and the authentication methods that they support is listed over here. For key pair authentication, one of the things to keep in mind is uh, it's it's used for data ingestion through Snowpipe and uh, uh, pretty widely deployed. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is you have to rotate the keys, and that you can do through a key management uh, tool such as HashiVault or some other CSP uh, tool that you are using. Now let's that's my favorite topic. Uh, just talking about passwords or uh, how they are a bane. Um, please use SSO, federated SSO, if you can for your users, your regular users, uh, over local authentication. And by local authentication, what I mean is you're creating users in Snowflake uh, with username, password. Um, I think one of the, and this is basically to centralize your identity flow. You, Snowflake is just another enterprise app, just like any other app, and you would want to use SSO cred uh, credentials there. One of the um, uh, scenarios where you would want to use uh, local username and password is when you have an admin and they want to get access to Snowflake if for some reason the connection to your IDP is hosed and there's an outage. Um, yes, enforce, enable MFA and uh, enforce it on uh, user and, and enforce it on privileged users, uh, ask it, uh, users to actually use MFA. Now this can be MFA that is, comes with your own IDP, Octa Azure AD. Uh, if you're not, if you don't have that, you can use the native MFA capability that Snowflake has, which is powered by Dio security. Uh, but please do have that; it improves your security posture. Have at least two account admins, so if one sort of leaves or goes on vacation, you, your users can reach out for resetting your passwords. Support can reach out for any issues. And we we actually uh, GA'd a feature last year called Password Policies where you could um, have specific uh, uh, password requirements like complexity, special characters, uh, retries, or uh, lockout duration. You can set this up and sort of be compliant to what your InfoSec team is asking for. Otherwise, you will default to the, the, the default password policy that uh, Snowflake has. It's a very nifty feature, a very widely used 
in, in a lot of our uh, top accounts, critical uh, strategic accounts, where you have local uh, username and password. Session policies, if you want to uh, restrict uh, session timeouts for UI sessions as well as driver sessions, so right now the default is 240 minutes. But so if for, for some reason you want the, uh, a long-lived session, say on a service account, or you want to have a short session for your admins uh, on, on the UI, you can actually play around with the timeout, have this session policy, and just like password policies and uh, network policies, it can be applied at an account level, at a user level, and the user overrides the account. Now, how many of you had wished that you could restrict access to web interface for a specific set of users? Show of hands. Well, this one, but <laughs> one over here, but a lot of, lot of customers have actually asked for this one, where they want specific set of customers to come through UI, and the rest through drivers. And the, the ones that are coming through uh, drivers, either through apps, they do not want them to access through UI. And we are introducing a feature called authentication policy, which will be in private preview, uh, end of July, I think. Um, and that has rest, uh, controls based on authentication methods and client types. So right now, the client types that we are going to uh, support is um, Snowflake UI, which covers both SnowSight and Classic Web UI. We have Snow, uh, Drivers, which covers all Go, JDBC, ODBC, and Snow SQL, this is CLI. So you can basically have specific user level authentication policies uh, to restrict access on all of these combinations. And one of, one of the things that we are planning to extend that authentication policy is enforce MFA in it. So you can actually say MFA and enforce MFA true and then apply it on all your admins and then, yeah, they will, they will be redirected to an um, enrollment process if they are not already enrolled. So talking about OAuth, one of the most popular authentication mechanisms, as I have mentioned before, we support two kinds, uh, external OAuth and Snowflake OAuth. We're just talking about OAuth, there is the, the OAuth architecture has three pieces. When you have the authorization server, which sort of dishes out the token uh, to the client, and then you have the service itself to which you are uh, authenticating uh, to. And in this case, Snowflake is the service. You would have a client app with a Snowflake driver in it, and you will have the trust formed between the authorization server and the service itself. So when to use, and what is external OAuth? When the authorization server is external, it belongs to Okta, Azure AD, and some custom IDP, uh, you would want to use external OAuth. In fact, the general recommendation is use external OAuth, has more capabilities in terms of flows supported. It supports code grant flow, client credential, uh, as opposed to Snowflake OAuth, where Snowflake is the authorization survey, it dishes out the token to the client. So if you don't have one, you can use that. And external OAuth is supported for service accounts or both programmatic, interactive access, and um, one thing is where Snowflake OAuth has an upside is you don't have to worry about the high availability. It's taken care of with Snowflake's HA. Whereas for um, the external OAuth, you have to make sure, I'm pretty sure that would be in place, but you have to make sure that the IDP has a, a high availability. But no matter which one you uh, choose, you have to authenticate as an app, you have to authenticate the user, end user first, and that can be through SAML, username, password, uh, what have you and then you can basically have an OAuth connection to Snowflake. So talking about um, service accounts, and we, we sort of introduced this concept, service accounts versus SSO, and uh, what to consider when. So if you have row access policies in column level security, you can have, you, you may have a service account per tenant, you can have multiple service accounts, and you can additionally have entitlement tables uh, for more granularity. And SSO provides that granular, uh, granularity or, uh, inherently because it directly goes to the end user as opposed to the app. Um, so uh, the, 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 app, the customer itself is, is the end user's identity that is captured. Um, for auditing purposes, again, um, as the service account is basically used wherever uh, audit logs or audit information is available as opposed to the actual user's identity. So definitely SSO is better there if you want to capture exactly who executed that query. And authentication methods, we support everything for service accounts, uh, but OAuth for SSO. So just summarizing in terms of sort of isolation patterns, um, you, you should, you can, and you should bring your uh, IDP uh, for OAuth in both the scenarios for MTT and OBT. 
Um, you sh you SSO is highly recommended uh, over service accounts if you want better granularity and to end visibility in both the scenarios. And uh, for deployment patterns, the app provider, again, just like network policy, the app provider is responsible for setting up security integrations, all the policies that we talked about, password session and authentication. Um, uh, whereas in the connected apps, the app consumer is responsible for that. And they also have to set up their um, uh, the OAuth IDPs as well as SAML IDPs if they have one. So I just wanted to actually give you a view of, we discussed all these constructs. How does uh, a typical uh, user login session look like? And where does all these policies come into picture? You have authentication policy, which is looked up first when the login comes in. Um, uh, password policy applies. If you have local uh, users, network policy is always there, without which you don't want to use your Snowflake account. And session policy, if you want to control the session uh, longevity. And with that, I'm going to pass on to Seth for access control. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the one note I would like to leave here after this, please don't use passwords. <laughs> passwords are bad. That, keep that in mind. That, passwords are bad. All right? Thank you very much. Now, access control. We introduced the concept of functional roles and access roles. Access roles basically are database significant, as we said, and those are used for read-write access to the database objects, right? Functional roles are mapped to the actual user uh, functions, like, you know, uh, analyst, payroll, or what have you. And you map the access roles to the functional roles. And then you grant the functional roles to the end um, user that needs to access. And that will help you with two things, ease of management, plus it will help you as well with, the, with applying the principle of least privileged access. So basically, a functional role need to access to specific data sets so you, where you can grant those access roles to the functional roles. And as we said, access roles should be provisioned via SQL because normally they don't live in your IDP while functional roles, probably they are in your IDP in a form of groups like an Okta or your custom IDP or what have you. Along with the users, those should be provisioned automatically to manage the life cycle of the identity. One of the main things we see in Snowflake, some you create a user and you forget about it. Deprovision if that user is no longer needed, and the IDP helps you to do so. Now, I want to zoom in a little bit into the connected app. Why? Because that one has the most sophisticated um, uh, separation of duties, because it's the same Snowflake account accessed by two separate entities. You, you like you own the account as a consumer, and the app provider needs to access that account to, for the app to run. So. Normally, you know, that you are an app consumer uh, and you do what all the other Snowflake uh, account uh, customers do. You enjoy in your life, you create in databases, drop in databases, spending credits with us. And you create here, then an app provider will come to you and then here's what happens. First of all, you own the account. Please do not give that app provider an uh, admin role. Please don't do this admin, right? I've seen it happening. So please don't do that. So what the app consumer does, will it create set of account level objects for that app provider, like databases, roles, and warehouses, because you want to control the cost, right? You don't want to give the app provider like, you know, I don't know, triple X warehouse to do whatever they, they want to do. No, control the cost and uh, create those for them. And then to actually make it easier for you, and to make sure the app provider is and as independent as possible, delegate access at the schema level objects to that app provider so they can be as, as uh, securely possible and dependent to do their jobs. And of course, please create tags, please create policies, and make sure those tags and policies will be applied to the database objects created for the app as per your regular uh, data governance practices you have in your Snowflake account. The app provider must apply those policies. The, uh, the app provider as well use the functional and access roles exactly the way you love. And the app consumer, you should be monitoring the policy, the tags, enforcement across all the database objects used by that data uh, uh, app provider. Now, we, we, you know, in the past, 
And uh, in data app environment, probably you want to share data for different reasons. You want to for enrichments, for example. I'm a I'm an app provider, for example. I have data set and I need to enrich the data set, right? So I might need a data share. In the past, when you use data sharing, you had only one privilege. It's called imported privilege. And that's all inclusive. That means you will grant access to all objects uh, in that data share. We introduced database level roles. So you can create a database level roles and those roles will give the app consumer and the app provider or like that, let's use the terms here, data apps or the data provider, data consumer, grant granular access at the objects within the share. What does that mean, right? You remember like, you know, Privacy and security, always a thing, right? Like, and now in the past, we used like to have those conversation, you know, down the line, but now those conversation jump in to the front lines, right? So in my conversation with customers, and I'm talking like to 500 of them, DPO or data protection officer, the security information officer, they join the conversation as early as possible. And then here with database roles, you as a da uh, data provider, you can go and use the database roles to create data masking policy based on those roles. And then the data consumer will go and use those uh, in, their, um, uh, in, their, in their environment to be matched and then the proper data masking policy, row access policy will be applied. And that will be thanks to this new context function that we call is database role in session. Right, and that will be matched in the execution context of the consumer. And then you will see what you are allowed to see as set by the data app provider. This is real time. If the data app provider changes the policy, it will apply automatically for all the data shares across the uh, uh, data consumer landscape. Now, let's see how this plays out in terms of isolation uh, patterns. In all isolation patterns, please use role hierarchy. Please use least privileged access. Don't give the app provider more than what they need uh, to do their jobs. So, in, and the thing is like I want to highlight as well, um, for the a a OPT and APT, you might need, please consider database roles. If you have data sharing cross accounts or you want to enrich your data, use database uh, role for that perspective. From uh, management or deployment perspective, the managed app should, the app provider should be managing all the aspects of roles and users. In connected apps, the app consumer is the one should be managing all that. And the app consumer should grant schema level object, objects to the app provider to do their jobs. Native apps, remember, native, native apps, the app runs in your environment. You own everything, you must control and manage all the aspects of, you, of uh, users and access control. Encryption. How many of you loves encryption? No, that's really surprising, right? Encryption. So Snowflake, you know, we do what we do. So we encrypt the data at rest using AAS-256, you know. And, um, you know, we uh, have a feature called Tri-Secret Secure, which is it's a mix between bring your own key and hold your own key, right? So this is why we called it Tri-Secret Secure. And we see Tri-Secret Secure in highly regulated industries, like, you know, um, uh, required by public sector or like financial services where they have this strict requirements. I want to encrypt my data using my own key. Now, today, keep that in mind here at the bottom level here, you see like uh, Tri-Secret Secure is an account level feature. It is not a database level feature, right? So in terms of OPT and MTT here, you know, the same account shared between different tenants, right? So if you want to bring your own key, you can do that, but that will be at the account level for all the tenants. But if multiple tenants, they want to have different keys, you might consider row access policies and column level security. Actually, you can have separate uh, encryption keys per tenant here using this feature. And we have a, like um, in the references a slide in the end, we have um, a link where you can actually see that. And we have sample queries for you to implement that sample code. And keep in mind when you do that, you, you know, when we say performance in Snowflake, that means you pay more money for us in terms of credits. So, you know, please do that. Keep that in mind. And if you do the, you know, encryption at the column level or format preserve encryption or tokenization, keep in mind you need to actually manage an external key, um, uh, encryption keys outside of Snowflake 
in with TSS, we manage all the keys and you bring only one key to the system. Now, for um, you know, account per tenant here, because every tenant has a separate uh, Snowflake account, they can bring their own key to the, to the mix. And this helps in highly regulated industries, like basically, I wanna stop that application. I don't wanna use it anymore. So I wanna delete all my data. So all what you need to do is just disable the key or remove the key, and you have something called a crypto deletion. And that's mostly, um, you know, acceptable in a lot of um, uh, organization. And, um, you know, because in terms of GDPR, for example, there is no quite definition what deletion means. Could be just a crypto deletion, could be sufficient for that use case. Let's see how that plays out in uh, deployment patterns. In general, the app provider uh, manages all the aspects of, of encryption. There are certain situations where uh, if you have managed app with account per tenant, I want as an app consumer, I have my key, I can give it to the app provider and the app provider can integrate that with the underlying Snowflake account. In the APT, uh, in the connected apps and the native apps, the app consumer should manage all the aspects of the encryption and the customer master key. And finally is the auditing and monitoring. And this is the most you know, underrated uh, capability that you should do. Here is, you have two options. But before I discuss the two options, I want to mention a few um, history objects. So, you know, I can speak about those now. You know, our uh, product manager, Raja, for uh, governance introduced like a lovely features for data governance. So please use the access history. There you can see the reads and writes against your uh, sensitive data. And the access history is enriched more and more. So you can see the applied policies, the tags applied to the policies. You can see the DML and the DDL as well in the, in the access history. Please use it as much as you can. And then, uh, you know, you can use object dependencies and you can have column level lineage to see how the objects are related uh, at the column level. Of course, you need to consider login and query history to see like how, who access what and where from, and then the query history, the full auditing and monitoring to the data interaction, to the user interaction with your data. Now we have two options, as we said, option A, which basically it's per account visibility, where you have an auditing and monitoring tool that connects to every single Snowflake account, right? And then you have option B, where basically every account can go and create an auditing and monitoring product, data product. And if you, if you, you can hear data products, if you attended a few sessions around data mesh, where basically here's what happens. You know, auditing and monitoring might have some uh, sensitive data as well. Maybe you don't want to have the sensitive data to be shared across the landscape of the deployment. Every Snowflake account, uh, the admin there uh, or the uh, security admin can create auditing and monitoring data product. You can go and apply tags. You can just mask those uh, sensitive columns. You can remove all the data that is not required and you can use data sharing to share all those objects and you have cross account visibility across all the deployment and that's option B. Now, let's compare this two. Let's uh, compare those two. From auditing and monitoring connectivity, in option A, you need to connect that to every single uh, Snowflake account. In option B, you connect it only to the dedicated auditing and monitoring Snowflake account. Visibility scope. So in visibility scope and in, in per account visibility, it's limited to one Snowflake account. And the auditing and monitoring tool should have some intelligence to go and aggregate the data from all the a Snowflake account. In option B, visibility scope is across the board, right? You have all the data there, sanitized, secured, you can have, and, and it helps you to scale as well. And the aggregation will be done by Snowflake. And that's what we do, right? Like, you know, we're great in joining tables, joining data products, and create uh, this secure view across all the underlying Snowflake accounts. Now, how this plays out from isolation patterns. So usually uh, in uh, MTT and OPT, normally you have like less number of Snowflake accounts. So probably option A is better fit here. In APT, we have app consumers, they may have hundreds of Snowflake accounts, right? We're not talking about like two, three, maybe 50, 100, 200 or more, right? And this is where maybe option B is better fit from security, as we said, like you can sanitize the data at the account level. and from scalability perspective. How this plays out, oh, before I forget, you remember the database role we discussed? Account usage, views, and the Snowflake database now 
had has built in database roles. Remember, like, you know, you need to prov prov provision access to all the account users with imported privileges. No, you don't need to do that. You can have a governance viewer, so you can see only the governance-related information. And maybe security viewer, where basically you can see all the related information, like login history and network policy application. How this plays out from uh, deployment patterns in managed app, the app provider manages all the um, aspect of auditing and monitoring. Option B could be better fit because the managed app may have multiple Snowflake accounts. Connected apps, basically the app consumer audit and monitor everything, but the app consumer can create limited view to show only the auditing and monitoring for the related objects for that app provider, not for everything, right? And here, like, now if you go with native app or uh, connected apps, you might choose option A, but if you have larger number of accounts, even like three, four, five, you may consider option B for better high uh, scalability and uh, security as well. And with that, pretty much covered everything. Thank you very, very much.